But uh, first, I want to say thank you so much to the organizers here. Uh, it was really great working with you, and I think that you have a really amazing conference today. I'm really excited to be my first time speaking in Poland. My grandfather was Polish. I know I'm so American when I say that, but my grandfather was Polish, and I think that he would be proud if he was still with us today. Um, I'm going to be talking about reliable models. Most of the time I work in NLP, so we're going to see some NLP examples. I'm really excited with how much NLP talks we have today, and I'm actually going to touch on some things that I think will be repeated throughout the different talks that you hear today and tomorrow. Oh, Linux. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a joke, other than the Linux joke, we're gonna start off with a machine learning joke. So who here works with machine learning? Excellent, you're my target audience, so apologies to anybody else here. Uh, but I don't know if you follow XKCD, it's my, fav uh, my favorite web comic, and I don't know if you saw this machine learning comic already, but I'll give you a chance to read it, if not, I had a good laugh with it. And yeah, you know, I think we can have a good chuckle. I think especially probably the machine learning practitioners in the room can have a good chuckle with this because sometimes, you know, my mom or something asks me what I do and I think it sounds like this and it might even sound like a really confused version of this. So uh, for those of you that are experts, of course, or that are researchers, it's far more complex than this. And I know that and I understand it. And there's plenty of great people in the room that are doing interesting work and in research with machine, machine learning. But the problem is, is that the ability for the average person, even let's say the average person with some basic math and statistics, to understand what's happening, particularly when we talk about these deep learning systems, it's difficult, right? And my fear is that our world, our world of machine learning and data science will become so separated from the average person's ability to understand what's happening that we will essentially specialize ourselves into oblivion. And we will essentially become so specialized expert technical elite uh, we've been seeing how that's been working out in the elections that have occurred in the past few years. That if you separate yourself so much and if the average person sees you as some sort of elite that's not answerable to any single person, then that's really easy to set yourself up for failure. And what I want is a long, without another AI winter, growth of our space and the science in our space. And I think to do so that we need to think about interpretability, not only for the conversations that we have with one another, but especially for the conversations that we have with other people who want to maybe learn or start using machine learning. And yet this is how it looks. So that's one good reason why we care about interpretability, but I also have some other reasons. The first and foremost, in my opinion, is the ability for area experts or your user to understand and interact with your models. So when we have, how many people here are area experts in what they're actually building machine learning on? Like you, okay. Very rare, right? Um, and that's really neat when you have that insight. I think that when you talk to somebody who's an area expert and they're doing machine learning within their own field of expertise, they have a lot of insight and they can understand what's happening and they can figure out better ways to generalize their models. But unfortunately, most of us are experts in mathematics or statistics or physics or whatever your background is. And instead, we're working with areas that we may or may not have a background in. And if we can't communicate clearly to the area experts and ask them, why is this failing? Why does this rationale make sense or does not make sense? Then we can't also grow from their feedback. So here is a shorter quote of which I'll read a longer one. Um, Tommy Yakula is a professor at MIT working on interpretability. There's a broader aspect to this work as well. You may not want to just verify that the model is making the prediction in the right way. You might also want to exert some influence in terms of the types of predictions that it should make. How does a lay person communicate with a complex model that's trained with algorithms that they know nothing about? They might be able to tell you about the rationale for a particular prediction 
In that sense, it opens up a different way of communicating with the model. And I think that that really resonated with me. How do we allow users and area experts to give and explain rationales to us so we can build a better model, right? This is feedback that we need. This is labeling that we need. And if we make it so complex that we can't talk with somebody about it, then we're going to have some serious issues later when it doesn't generalize well or when it's learned something that we didn't intend for it to learn. And this goes into GDPR. So GDPR is the general data protection regulation that will be coming into play in all of the EU in May of 2018. And I have a longer post and talk about this and what it means for us as data scientists, but I think it's important for us to think about and talk about. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I know nothing about law, really. So I'm not here to talk with you about compliance. What I'm here to talk with you about is some of the intention behind the regulation from being a lay person who's read through things and talked with and read a few legal papers on the subject. Article 13 is often referenced in this quote unquote right to an explanation. You might have heard the right to an explanation, you might have heard people really being fear mongering about it, but I would say it's less of a right to an explanation and it's more of a right for the user to be informed how their personal data is going to be used. And Article 13 says the controller, which is any of us that use personal data, says the controller shall, at the time when personal data are obtained, provide the data subject with the following further information. It goes through a series of points, of which one is the existence of automated decision making, meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and the envisaged consequences of such processing for the data subject. What does this mean? This means that if I'm a user and you're using my personal data, now we can define what that means or doesn't mean, but you're using my personal data to make some automated decision learning about me, some automated machine learning that may affect my life, may affect my use on your site, may even affect what ads I'm shown, but it also might affect something like whether I get a bank loan, or it might affect something like whether my doctor recommends treatment or not. This is something that I have a right to know about, and this is something that I have a right to have access to some information of how that algorithm works or how that data or decision was reached. So this is something we should con be concerned about, and if we're using something that's very, very uninterpretable, we might have an issue explaining things, and we might have an issue in terms of transparency. And I think if we're concerned about transparency, then maybe we should think about why we're so concerned. Are we concerned about transparency because perhaps we are a bit ashamed with what our machine learning is doing? Or perhaps what we're doing we would classify as unethical or immoral as people? And if so, maybe we should at least think about that. Finally, models can learn unintended stereotypes or biases from our world. So models, as we've seen and shown, these are from the Google News Vectors. Uh, these are the Google News Vectors used with Jensen. And what we can see is that man is to woman as computer programmer is to homemaker. Uh, we can also see that some vectors that are nearby Mexicans are illegals and illegal aliens and other things. I did a longer exploration of this, of which I have a write-up on it, but I would say that there is definitely pornographic content in the Google News vectors, and there's probably some other unintended side effects that you don't necessarily want to use as a basis for your deep learning language model. So if you're just using the word to vet Google News vectors and retraining the top layer, perhaps you might need to think about what that unintended effect on your chat bite bot might have that perhaps maybe you don't want your chatbot using these types of stereotypes in their interactions with users on your website or in your app, whatever it is. There's quite a good paper on this, and it's by Arvind Narayanan, Joanna Bryson, and Ellen Kaliskan, and it explores some of the stereotypes that are easily found in the news vectors that Google released and several other vector spaces, even when you use glove training on the same data. So clearly, 
there's some reasons for interpretability. And one of them, that final one, is perhaps finding those types of issues in your data before your user or a researcher or somebody else does. So moving forward, we want to create interpretable models. How can we go about doing so? I'm here to share with you some of the ways that we possibly can, but by no means is this a closed space. So we're also gonna talk about the challenges and we're gonna talk about research that is open and welcome for you to participate in. The initial stage that we need to do is define what interpretability or explain explainable models means in our space or to our users. So interpretability can mean a very different thing if it's simply your team of data scientists that needs to interpret and understand and talk with one another how the model is operating. And it can mean something completely different if the interpretability is an end user that has no experience or background in statistics. So what we have here is a great quote and I thought that it was relevant from a paper that I'll refer to a few times which is called, Why Should I Trust You? And these researchers, they're based at the University of Washington, and they've released actually an open source Python library to help interpret your models. And they define interpretability um, in an explanation, really. The notion of interpretability also depends on the target audience. Machine learning practitioners may be able to interpret small Bayesian networks, but laymen or laywomen may be more comfortable with a small number of weighted features as an explanation. And we're gonna dive a little bit into this, but you need to define it for your use case. So if your use case is that you only need to, uh, you only need to explain interpretability with your coworkers, then you can probably make a much more complex model. And I would say go for it. Um, if your explainability needs to be for some end user or for a banker or a police officer or something else, then maybe you need to think about how to best convey that to your user and start building or using the algorithms that are already available from cognitive, cognitive science to say, okay, is this understandable for a human? And there's quite a lot of research already in this space. So that same paper is the paper that introduced Lime. Now they have two papers and they have an open source Python library. And Lime is called Local Interpretable Model Explanations. And what it aims to do is it aims to explore local interpretability of what they call black box classifiers. So unfortunately this is only available for classifiers. I'm going to put that big disclaimer first. So you can't use this with anything other than classifiers. But what they were able to show, and this is a screenshot from their O'Reilly blog post about it, is they were taking images, they took a CNN, and what they were able to show is, okay, this image is classified as a tree frog. Then they built what they called perturbed instances, which is essentially clusters of pixels. With these perturbed instances, they then tried to define the minimal cluster of pixels that could achieve the maximum probability. So they put it through some regression, of course, and then we have the final explanation. And in this explanation, we can see, okay, the face of the tree frog is what this locally, this is the local optimal minimum solution. So how does it work in a broader sense? The researchers also included this image, which I feel like was useful for understanding the overall concept of what they're trying to do, and perhaps useful in the sense that if you're a researcher in this space, maybe this can inspire you to work on something other than just classification. Here we have a function. It is our classifier. We have red and blue, so we only have two classes. And we can see that it's not a linear explanation, that there's no global expl explanation that can work for us. We take the red X and we say, why does the red X, you know, why is it classified as red? And what we can do is by taking different samples around it, or in the case of their model, actually take samples from it and determine, okay, what is the derivative at this location? Now this is a local explanation. It only works for potentially even that red X, depending on the location of that red X. But 
what it can do is it can allow us to explain these local minimums, right? And when we're able to explain at least the local explanations, that gives us a starting place. It gives us something intuitively that we can understand, that we can look at, and that we can perhaps give to others uh, without, of course, a chart and show them, okay, this is why the model has learned this, or this is what the network has learned within this specific case. So beyond Lime, there's actually some other open source Python libraries for this. And one of them is ELI5. And ELA5 is after the famous internet meme of explain to me like I'm five. And what ELI5 does is it gives you the ability to run text classification. Now Lime does as well. Um, they're a, a bit of a competition in that space, but ELI5 also plugs into Lime. So ELI5 is a great starting place. And here is an example from the 20 news groups data set. So it was trained, a uh, classic 20, 20 uh, news groups data set, and its goal is to classify the text. What ELI5 gives you is it's going to go through a set of samplers, and it's gonna go through 5,000 samples of different tokenization. So here you have in the background, what's running is you have this text, it's going to create 5,000 samples of this text, and then it's going to compute uh, in different ways of tokenizing, and it's going to use the same tokens, but it's going to show different tokens to the model, and it's going to try to find the combination that increases or decreases the probability of it being classified as medical text. And what we can see is the tokens that have contributed the most are in the darker green, and the tokens that have detracted the most are in the darker red. And so we can see kidney stones, medication, pain. These make sense to us. One thing that didn't make sense to me is why x-ray seems to be in red. And I believe my intuition in looking at it is I can see x is highlighted, the hyphen is not, so perhaps it's removed during tokenization, and the ray is highlighted strongly. And for me, the first question that I had is, how did they choose tokenization and pre-processing of this text? And could we perhaps find a better way to do so, so that X-ray is in green, as I believe it probably should be? So what I would say is that, just from me looking at their tutorial and walkthrough, I was like, ah, this could be perhaps something that we could use a character RNN for, or that we could use a different type of tokenization, and we could compare our models and perhaps improve or generalize our model further by actually looking at the explanations and saying, as a human, with my common sense, this doesn't make sense to me. So I think explanations can work not only to help create uh, explanations for the end user, but also create explanations for yourself where you can further enhance your model given the feedback. ELI5 also works with XGBoost. And who here is working with XGBoost? Who here is working with XGBoost on Kaggle? <laughs> Only. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that there's an XGBoost talk, which I'm pretty excited to go to. I think XGBoost is very hyper cool right now, and I want to be with the cool kids, so I'm going to learn all about XGBoost. Um, so XGBoost, though, is a bit difficult to interpret because of the way that the weights change with the residuals. It can be difficult to interpret. And so one thing that ELI5 gives you is a visualization of your weights. Uh, this is, of course, pretty simple here. When we use the Titanic data set and we do no feature engineering, it can be pretty easy to say, oh yeah, if you're a woman, you probably survived. And if you're in the third class, you probably died. But this is a really, this is a toy example, right? Our Titanic data set is only here as a toy example. We can also see that, you know, although this is useful, what do the weights, what do the contribute, uh, contribution of the weights actually mean? This doesn't necessarily give me as a human a big intuition other than, you know, the simple variance that we can see. It doesn't give me a good intuition of what this actually means. And I would say that this is more of a critique of XGBoost as a model, and also how we can discuss and decide better ways that we can interpret this type of data. They go on in their tutorial to extract a few 
different features for name, name ending, a few things like that. So it's worth reading through um, because there is some neat things that you can do with the ELI 5 library. Moving beyond simple machine learning models and into neural networks, uh, they are tremendously difficult to explain. One shining light in that is attention-based networks. So I don't know if you've been reading or using attention-based RNNs, but they're a way that we can more easily introspect what the model has learned. And this is because attention-based RNNs allow us to see what's essentially being kept in RAM, right? And if we can check what's being kept in memory, we can start to say, ah, the model has focused on this, the model has retained that, and so forth. There's a really interesting paper, or there's many, many interesting papers about attention-based RNNs, but one one that I felt was particularly demonstrative of interpretability and introspection was this show, attend, tell, which is a neural image caption R RNN. And in their paper, they also shared some interesting mistakes, and they were able to take a look at mistakes that their model made, and they were able to show where the network was focused, what was held in memory at the point in time that it generated the text for the caption. And here we can see we have, I don't know if it's easy to discern, but we have two giraffes standing, and when the neural network was focused on the two giraffes standing there, it saw a bird. And it classified a woman who is speaking and she has a logo on her sweatshirt. It classified the logo as a clock. And let's just say we might have some issues with violinists. And this indeed helps us train better models. When we can understand the areas that the network is having a problem with, we can think of better training samples. We can think of adversarial examples that might help improve our model. And so I would say that particularly in the case of RNNs, one easy way to start saying, ah, this is how it's being tricked, is by using an intention-based one where you can actually see what's being accessed in memory and what's being stored over time. And there's also some interesting work on attention-based NLP models, so I can also share more research with you if you're intrigued by this, because for me this was quite interesting to take a look at. Moving also back into the NLP world, there is a great paper and also an open source Python library uh, from the Rationalizing Neural Predictions paper. And this set of researchers, they took on a series of common NLP tasks, of which one is multi-aspect sentiment analysis. So this is the ability to look at a review and say, these parts of the review tell me about this aspect, these parts of the review tell me about this other aspect, and they use the famous beer reviews data set. So if you like beer, uh, this is a very fun data set to play with. Even if you don't like beer because it's very properly labeled and it's nice to have good labels for something like multi-aspect sentiment analysis. But what they were able to do is they were able to build what they call a generator and encoder. And with this generator and encoder, not dissimilar to other generators and encoders you might use with RNNs or other deep learning frameworks, uh, they wanted to generate the smallest explainable parts of text and then encode them and run the prediction or the predicted score for that aspect on them. Then they were able to use this to find the phrases, and they had optimized actually for phrases, so they optimized for connected speech rather than disparate tokens. And what they were able to show is some really interesting stuff. So they could say the aroma is kind of bubblegum-like and grainy, and out of the whole review, this is the most important text for the two stars. Now to a human, this is like, Catherine, this is not very impressive. I could read this and highlight this in five seconds. And yes, indeed, the beer data set really lends itself to this, and we can talk about all sorts of problems of sentiment analysis. I have lots of opinions on this. Um, but the point is, is that we're starting to perhaps create things that can create small explanations, small rationales, as they call them, and we can start to see if our network is making sense, or perhaps it has learned a few keywords, or somebody's name, or something else, and we can start to debug why it won't generalize, 
or why it might not be converging and so forth. And finally, uh, we have the famous or historical examples, which are primarily rule and probability based systems. So I'm really excited that uh, probabilistic programming is back in fashion. I think there's a few other probability experts in the room that are probably pretty excited about this too. It seems that probability is again uh, the new hotness or maybe has always been hot but people are talking about it more. Anyways, when we use rule and probability based decision systems, these are pretty easy to explain. When we use statistical models and they make sense of our data and they're simple, then we can easily share them with say a doctor and we can say, hey, you can take a look at this rule set, which is a decision list um, using Bayesian analysis, was a decision list that was developed with the breast cancer data set. And as a doctor, you could think, ah, they can read this. They can reason with it. Perhaps they can even disagree with it in a meaningful way. So perhaps we don't see here, we don't have genetic information about if the gene that has been linked to breast cancer is there. So if they're perhaps using that as an indicator, maybe they're making a different decision. But they can actually decide that as an area expert, rather than just say, trust this machine. The machine will tell you how to do your job. And I think that that level of transparency, particularly in the highly regulated industries, is essential. And especially when we're talking about law, we're talking about people's lives, we're talking about banking, we're talking about their, their money, their ability to get a loan, their ability to own a house, their ability to do normal things in their life. And we're talking about medicine. I don't necessarily want my doctor to have a black box model that it feeds my data and then it goes mine some word vectors and then it tells me, oh, you're pregnant or something. I don't necessarily want that to be my future life. So I would like us also to think about these rule and probability based systems. And I'm not saying stop the research we're doing, stop the work we're doing. I think we can do both simultaneously. I think we can find new really cool ways to use neural networks. And then we can try to find ways to simplify what we've learned from the neural network to create probability based systems. And I, I don't see these as massively divergent. Of course, they're going to be done by different researchers, but I also think that uh, there's a lot of interesting work happening in Bayesian neural networks and other things which might help give us insight or also in sparse vector parameterization that might give us the ability to have better insight into what is in our data and what these deep learning networks have learned. So what problems are still unsolved? as I'm sure if you're a machine learning practitioner, you're like, Catherine, you haven't talked about a million things. Yes, I haven't, and I'm sorry for that. Now we'll talk about all of the problems. Uh, interpretability is still a really, really broad research space, and uh, there's many, many problems. So if you're a student in this room and you're like, hmm, I don't know what I'll do my thesis on, uh, please, for, for the hope of all of us, do it on interpretability or something related to interpretability. Uh, here is a screen grab from ML4A, which is an open source book for artists. And it tries to teach artists how to use machine learning, particularly, of course, generative ad adversarial networks, to do really cool stuff with art. And what they use is they use the CIFAR model, and they can show all of these pretty little images and then the probability that there's an airplane there or that there's a bird there. And I think as an artist, you're probably like, oh, wow, this is really pretty. And then as somebody who's trying to interpret networks, you're like, what is going on? I cannot see. Filter 5 has an airplane, evidently. I don't see it. I guess maybe blue because of the sky. These are the types of inferences that we have to make. And we use our human-based pattern matching to find patterns where perhaps there actually are none. And this is a problem that we have with interpretability, especially of neural networks, is we take time to introspect them. We look at each of the layers, particularly for visual models, but now also somewhat for language-based models, and we say, ah, yeah, I think it's learned something there. How much of that can we actually mathematically prove, and how much is us just finding patterns because that's what we're good at? I leave that for debate. Another big problem in interpretability is multidimensional predictions. So often we're working in a space with 300 to 500 
uh, even more dimensions, and our feeble little human brains are like, what is going on? So when we think about these multidimensional things, particularly, let's say, in NLP, we try to find ways to project them into a space we can understand, 2 or 3D, right? And this is a screenshot from my co-organizer of Pi Data Berlin, Matti Lyra. And he will very soon be finishing his doctorate in topic modeling. And he gave a really great talk at Pi Data Berlin this year on understanding topic modeling. And he was using PCOA, which is very similar to PCA. And he was also using metric multidimensional S. And I'll just see, say PCOA and MMDS from here on forward. And these are ways that you can take these topic models and you can project them into a two-dimensional space so you can analyze, uh, is this a good number of groups? Is this a good number of topics? Is my model working to find topics for your text? And here on the left, we have PCOA. And he's highlighted group uh, topic number 10 and topic number 15. And we can see they're quite close together. And also that quite a lot of the topics are clustered close together. And then on the right, we see MMDS. This is the same data set. And they are nearly opposite ends of our metric space. Why? And this is simply because of the projection that we use and the parameters that we use with our projection. But how can we actually make sense of this as humans? If we're using these projections to make sense and we change the algorithm slightly or we change the parameters slightly and we get a completely different projection, how can we then say that this projection is a good explanation? I don't think we can say. I think that this is still an open area of research and. I think that depending on your understanding of the underlying data, you can probably justify the left or the right diagram. But I think if you're just saying, oh, yeah, no, I'm just going to use TSNI, and it makes sense, and look, uh, let's move on, that perhaps there's more to the problem than simply using a multidimensional projection into a space that we can understand. Also, labeling is hard, and sampling is hard. And we'll talk about each individually. The comic is a little bit more about labeling, but I'll, I'll tie it into sampling. And I'll give you a moment to read it. This is uh, Calvin and Hobbes. And yeah, I mean, depending on where your data is coming from and who's labeled it and how many mechanical Turks were used and how much instruction they were given before they were mechanical Turking your data, uh, this could be a problem for you, right? And hopefully you're doing some normalization or regularization or you're using some sort of scalar so you perhaps find this outlier or you remove it in some way, shape, or form. But my warning here is just that these things can hide in plain sight. And depending also on your normalization use, they can just become another data point that supposedly makes sense. Then when, say, you're using sampling and you say, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select some samples. Maybe I'm going to select some samples that confuse the model. And then I'm going to select some samples that are really average of the model that explain the, the normal occurrences you might select this, or you might select something like it, or you might leave it out. And either way, you ha you're making some sort of conclusion about your model and what your model has learned and how your model behaves based on a sample. And sampling is hard. We know this. Sampling is hard. It is still an area of open research uh, hundreds of years after people first started talking about it. So I think sampling is really difficult, too, when we think about interpretability. And how can we choose a good representative sample that we can use for good uh, exp explanations and poor explanations? And there's a few good papers on this, and some of them have libraries attached. I'll be writing up a lo much longer blog post of all of my research on this with a bunch of links for you if you're interested. And Kaggle was already mentioned. But I say that I feel like we're in a phase of what I call Kagglification. 
And I feel like the more and more I talk with people in the space, uh, particularly those that are avid Kagglers, I have nothing against Kaggle. I think it's fun to play games and it's fun to gamify hard problems. And cool, if you can make money off of Kaggle, so be it. But uh, I would say that Kagglification is also bringing us the death by 1,000 models. And it seems, I found this quote for looking around on good quotes about Kaggle and ensembling, which is that ensembling of different types of models is part of Kaggle 101. If you don't do it, you're at a disadvantage. Now, should you do it in a business environment? That's a very different question. But in Kaggle, you should. And this is the case, right? When you look at the top Kaggle models now, sometimes they're averaged across 10,000 different models, 1,000 models at least. Um, beyond that, there's been a bunch of tuning of parameters. There's been also over-engineering, I would say, of features. Uh, everybody's using polynomials and, and so forth. And that's great, that's fine. But my fear is that when Kaggle bleeds over into our daily decisions, when we start to say, I don't know, I was got you know top top 30% in the last competition. I think I'll try some of this at work. And my my fear for this is we definitely lose interpretability, right? We can't interpret ensemble models, especially as humans, even if we can interpret them mathematically, as humans being able to explain an ensemble and to be able to explain, let's say, the average weights across the ensemble is really difficult for us to do in a meaningful way. And so I don't, wanna, I don't want people to stop caggling. I think it's fun. But what I do want to have is better conversations in the workspace of when these types of ensemble models have a place and perhaps when interpretability or um, knowing and understanding what your model has learned is more key. Speaking of which, uh, I will have a blog series based on taking winning Kaggle models, trying to interpret them, and then trying to slowly break them down into something that you actually can interpret. And in doing so, I've been working with some of the winners of the Kaggle house price data set. And I decided, ah, oh, yeah, I'll just put it into ELI 5 and see what happens, right? Like, what could go wrong? But, oh, man, X7. X7 is the worst, you guys. It's really awful. X7, X4787, that's really going to make your house price quite a bit higher. And the problem here is that, yes, we're using polynomial features, and I think for Kaggle, that's fine. But if this is in a model that you're actually trying to explain or use at work and say, what has your model learned, we are so far from any meaningful feature that uh, we would have to basically restart from scratch or completely re reverse engineer what has occurred with these over, I would say, over-engineered features. So for a competition, great, fun, and for real life in the sense of, hey, I need to explain to my coworkers or to my boss or to the end user or to the area expert, I need to explain what my model has learned, this makes no sense to a human. So perhaps now you're inspired and we're like, ah, how can we help? Well, there's clearly a lot of areas that are open. I hope you're inspired. I hope you're not depressed. I hope you're also not like, I don't care, I like Kaggle, so. Uh, the first thing is cultural. So I feel like this is both a cultural, as we've talked about, and a technical problem. And the cultural things we can do, I think, are to teach, practice, and preach interpretability. Again, I am not anti other ways of doing things, but I do think that if we're having more conversations about interpretability, this can benefit us as a community. So why not just, you already have the rock curve or whatever else you're showing to be like, I'm the smartest model ever that's been built. Why not also include a section on interpretability in your curriculum or your blog posts or your talks? Just one short one, it could be, hey, I found out that I couldn't interpret this model. But if this becomes more of a norm, at least we're having the conversation, at least we're starting to understand what is interpretable and what isn't. If you're a researcher or you work at a cool research lab, if you have access to TPUs and so forth, then work on difficult problems in the interpretability space and share your results. Come give this keynote next year. I don't wanna be talking. I want to listen to somebody who's researching on this space. 
add sample explanations and introspection of your models or architecture into your daily workflow. And I put daily there, but really what I mean is your average workflow that you do when you begin a machine learning problem and perhaps you're doing some exploration, I want at some stage there to be an interpretability or introspection step, or at least a sample explanation. So choose a subset and try to explain them. And if you work this into your daily workflow, I think not only will the tools grow and change, but that we can help figure out better open source ways to solve these problems. And finally, talk with your colleagues and peers. So I hope to have many conversations. I, I will be here all day today and tomorrow. And I hope to chat with you if you're working in the space or if you're intrigued by the space. But I also mainly want you to chat with one another and chat with other researchers. Finally, the technical aspects. What can we do technically? And I think that we can embrace more interpretable model engineering. So when you're doing feature engineering, ask yourself, am I doing the Kaggle thing again? And if the answer is yes, perhaps think, do I actually need to do the Kaggle thing right now? Or can I perhaps find a way that is slightly more interpretable? Challenge yourself to build the MVP of models, and I mean the minimal viable model. And what I mean by that is start off simple, start off basic, check your interpretability and your accuracy then. Further build and develop and check your interpretability and your accuracy again. And see where it breaks. See where your interpretability breaks, and let's say your ac accuracy becomes amazing, then at least you know the breaking point of whatever model or architecture you're using. And finally, I think that we really need to begin, especially as an open source community, figure out how do we measure interpretability. And there's actually quite a lot of research on this already. There's quite a lot of algorithms that are available already on this. So how can we then work this metric or measurement into our daily work? So we can say, yeah, my accuracy is here, my F1 score is this, and my recall is so-and-so, and my interpretability is this. And I think that this would be really powerful because then it's something that we can optimize. And we seem to be very good at optimizing things. So I would appreciate if we can also try to optimize for interpretability. So I want to say thanks so much again, and thank you for taking time to listen to me today. And I really hope that we can have further conversations. If you want questions, I don't know if we have time now, but you can always find me later. I'm at KJAM on Twitter. I'm at kyamastan.com. And also, I will be posting a lot of longer thoughts on this and a bunch of research you can read and Python libraries you can play with by the end of the today, I promise. It's not up yet, but by the end of today. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Katrin. Uh, I think uh, we can do the Q&A session drinking coffee. So, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can find Katrin over there. Uh, are you going to join the after party tonight and stay tomorrow? Yeah.